Okay, ready? Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you. I'm Heidi Daniel. I'm the president and CEO of the Enoch Pratt Free Library. And I want to thank you for joining us tonight for this very special edition of the Brown Lecture Series featuring Deborah Lee. Free events like this would not be possible without the generosity of our private donors. And I'd specifically like to thank the Eddie C. and C. Sylvia Brown Foundation for funding tonight's event and purchasing all of the books. So hopefully you all got one of these gorgeous books sitting out there. This event is one of the many we have going on at the Pratt this spring. As usual, our fantastic staff has created an amazing lineup for you. Next week, we'll welcome Chrissy King to the Pratt Writers Live stage with her book, The Body Liberation Project. That's March 16th. And if you have little ones, Read to Reef Book Club is coming back this March. So you can stop by any Pratt location where students fifth grade and younger can get a special bookmark while supplies last, read any five aquatic themed books, and earn four tickets to the National Aquarium. And that's not all. March 25th will transform this entire Central Library into a free family, family festival to celebrate the kickoff of our imagination celebration. If you have little ones, you won't want to miss it because it'll be like you're entering a book. So even if you don't have little ones, feel free to come and, you know, just check it out anyway. <laughs> Now for tonight's a big event. Deborah Lee is the former CEO of Black Entertainment Channel. Her new memoir, which you all have received a copy of, shares her journey from a childhood in the segregated South to the head of the first Black-owned company traded on the New York Stock Exchange. So what a fitting event for International Women's Day. Tonight, she is in conversation with Glory Glory Edom, Edom, sorry, um, Glory Edom, founder of the literacy nonprofit Well Read Black Girl. It is my pleasure to welcome to the Pratt stage Deborah Lee and Glory Edom. Thank you. Hello. 
Hello, everyone. Hi. I think we need to do one more round of applause. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I am so beyond honored to be in conversation with you oh, this evening. You. We've done it once already. Yeah, <laughs> if you were watching, I did something on our IG Live. So that was our primer, but this yeah. is the real deal. Right. Now the book is out. Yes, the book is out. Yes. Yes. Oh. It came out yesterday, and I've been waiting a long time. So I'm happy it's out. Um, I think that like the, the question that you probably have heard over and over again, but we, let's just get it out the way. Why? Like, why? why now? Why write the book? Why tell the story? Just why was it so important for you to write I Am Deborah Lee? Yeah, okay, I'm going to quote two people. First of all, Michelle, well, first of all, I'm thrilled to be here. Yay, Baltimore. And, <laughs> and thank you all for coming. Um, so, um, Michelle Obama said everybody has a story. And it's true. Everybody has a story. Now, that doesn't mean everybody's going to buy your book. <laughs> if you write one, but everybody does have a story. Uh, and then, I, and, and then recently, I heard Steven Spielberg say, "No one knows your story until you tell them." Mm -hmm. He said that at the Golden Globes. Mm -hmm. That was after I wrote the book, so I was really happy to hear that. Um, so I stepped down from BET about four years ago, 2018, and I have been there 32 years. And That's yeah, incredible. it was a long time. Yeah. <laughs> I started out as general counsel, vice president and general counsel in uh, 1986. Uh, I was a six year associate at a law firm. And um, so I was general counsel for 10 years. I was COO for 10 years. I was CEO for 13 years. So when I stepped down, I realized I was very unusual. They say the, the, the average life of not life, but the tenure <laughs> of a CEO is three to four years. And I was like, well, no one ever told me that. I, I had a lot of work to do and I was just working. And then a COO usually is not around for 10 years. It's like, if they don't get the CEO job in four years, they're gone. Right. None of this I knew. So <laughs> I'm just working, working. Uh, so when I finally decided to leave, um, you know, it was retirement age, and I never really thought about retirement. But anyway, I retired, and then I looked around and realized how few black women there are in CEO positions. Yeah. I mean, when I say few, it's, you know, there are two in the uh, Fortune 100. And one leaves, and, you know, we've lost 50% of them. All right. Um, and I wondered why that was. And um, so I said, I want to write a book. And because I always ask by young people, well, how'd you do it? Yep. Uh, so I said, I'm going to write a book and explain how I did it. I never set out to be a CEO. Um, I didn't even know that was a thing that I could do. Um, when I got the job at BET as vice president and general counsel, I thought that was as high as I could go right. as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So I didn't think of going anywhere else. But then I started doing more business things as the years went by. So anyway, I wanted to show young people that we're all human. We all have challenges. We all make mistakes. And But if you have a dream and you work hard and you're passionate about it, you can do it. Yeah. And that's the reason I wanted to write it. And I think anyone reading this book, in particular, a young Black woman who has aspirations of climbing the corporate ladder, mm -hmm. becoming a lawyer, becoming the next CEO, they will have your book as guidance. Because not only do you tell your life story, but you also just have a way of showing the business side, mm -hmm. how you manage men, how you transition, how you balance motherhood. All of that resides in this book. Right. And I want, I'm going to read your book back oh, to you. Okay. <laughs> so in chapter four, you mm. say, I've never had a female mentor. Very Let true. that sink in. Throughout my entire professional life, from Harvard Law to the coveted federal clerkship and then big law, the people who shaped my career were men, always men. Never once did I have a woman to follow, ask advice from, or simply vent to. Yeah. So Very now true. you have this space. Yeah. And now women can look, even if they don't meet you in person, your book can serve as right. mentorship. Right. Tell us why that was so significant to be a mentor, to well, really, you know, give yeah. that to folks. Well, I've always liked um, 
giving back yep. and helping those who come behind me. I was counselor at Brown, minority peer counselor. When I went to Harvard, I was a board of student advisors, which was basically the same thing. You get through the first year and you help those who come behind you. Right. It's just what I did. I was raised that way. And uh, I always thought I was normal. You know, I you just said a few minutes ago, I wasn't the smartest kid in the in the room, in the school or anywhere near it, uh, but I worked hard. And I wanted um, young people that came behind me know not fear, not be overcome with fear. Yep. And so um, this is a continuation of that. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I didn't have a female mentor or sponsor, because I talk about the difference between the two, sponsor someone that makes sure your name is spoken in the room mm -hmm. when you're not there. Mm -hmm. uh, a mentor may be someone you just go out to lunch with four times a year. Okay. Uh, but because I didn't have that, it was, it was difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew I wanted to have children. I never doubted that. I knew I wanted a family. And my generation was first generation of women, in my mind, that tried to do both. Yeah. I have a sister who's nine years older than me. And when she came out of college, you either did the career or you did the family. You didn't think you could do both. So right. here I am trying to do both, mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to best breastfeed my child <laughs> and do conference calls at the same time. Mm -hmm. It was really a challenge and I didn't have anyone to ask. Um, and so I, I have what I call um, far away mentors, mm -hmm. um, like Ruth Simmons, who is president of Brown. Mm -hmm. after I attended Brown, but she um, begged me to come back on the board mm -hmm. and really almost twisted my arm off. <laughs> you know, it was very gangster the way she got me back on the board. <laughs> she, she called me like three different times. I said no three different times. And the third time she said, okay, Debbie, this is the last time I'm gonna call you. So if you say no, I'm never gonna call you again. <laughs> and she said, and I kept saying, oh, I just became CEO, so I don't have time. She said, second of all, I have a lot of CEOs on my board. There you go. And that's not an excuse. They have time. They make time. Mm -hmm. And then she said, third, I understand you have a daughter who's a junior in high school. <laughs> <laughs> who may be looking for a college soon. And we look with favor upon children of board of trustee members. I said, wow. She was like all the things. <laughs> so even though, and so out of those uh, meetings with Ruth, we became friends, but never had the kind of friends where we had lunch a lot. But I just watched her. I watched her, how she handled the board of trustees, how she handled the administration, mm -hmm. how she handled the students. Because yep. if any of y'all know anything about Brown, students there protest everything. <laughs> They just, they're never happy. Mm -hmm. You know, Vietnam War, you know, investment that in South like Africa. Howard. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> very much like Howard. Uh, investment in South Africa. There's always protests. And I said, you know, I said to Ruth, you're going to have a hard time dealing with these students. And she said, no, I got this. Mm -hmm. And she handled everything with perfection. And uh, so just watching her do it helped me. I talk a lot about Aretha Franklin. Oh, oh you know, that's my next question. Okay. <laughs> I'll let that you was, ask that the question. That was absolutely my favorite chapter. I love Aretha Franklin. Yeah. And just the way you describe their friendship and how it was like this natural progression of just like, Debbie, give me those tickets. Right. <laughs> to, you know, oh, I'm going to this event. And you know it full well, you're ready to, you knew Eric. Right. You know, oh, I'm not, not going to do this any spoilers. But okay. there, there's such particular, really beautiful moments where you talk about how that friendship develops. Yeah. Can you share it? Just like what she means to you. Right. And I was, you know, literally scared of Aretha. Because <laughs> I'm kind of an introvert and, you know, I don't like meeting. I really don't like meeting celebrities. I had to get over that. How is that even possible? I know. It was a job I had. I had to get used to it. But, you know, when you idolize Aretha or Smokey Robinson or... Um, Patty LaBelle, yep. and then all of a sudden you grow up in your career, you're giving them honors, mm -hmm. and they're saying they love you, and I'm like, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it, I'm pinching myself, and, uh, but Aretha, most, most celebrities would call my people, yep. you know, whoever was doing the show, whoever, whatever, Aretha would call me and ask for whatever she wanted. The first time she called me, we were giving her a walk of fame. We had a walk of fame outside BET's headquarters in DC. Mm -hmm. And we were giving her a walk of fame and she called me and said she needed a winter wardrobe. 
And I was like, doesn't she live in Detroit? <laughs> Why would she need a winter wardrobe to come to DC? It's, it's warmer in DC, right? And so I said, we can't do that. And I had to tell her no several times because I just didn't have the money. We were struggling, you know, mm-hmm cable network at the time. And she usually understood, but she she kept asking. She kept asking. And I never really knew whether she liked me or not mm-hmm. until near the end of our relationship. And even when I went to her funeral, I won't tell the story you alluded to, but when I went to her funeral, you know, I went by myself, mm-hmm. went to Detroit, yeah. <laughs> um, got to the funeral, wasn't sure who was going to be there. Yeah. You know, I could have been put in the back of the room. I didn't know. And when I got there, some of her people said, oh, Miss Lee, you know, Miss Franklin, be so happy you're here. Come Aww. with me. And they took me down to like the second row. Oh, wow. I was in front of Clive Davis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was in front of Neil Portnoy, who was head of the Recording Academy. I was looking around. I was like, how did I get here? But it really showed me that she respected me. Yes. And But I remember being in the sixth grade, mm-hmm. you know, watching Soul Train. That was the only black show we had. And I had to do my chores mm-hmm. before one o'clock so I could watch Soul Train and learn the dances, see the fashion, <laughs> hear the hottest music. That was the only thing that connected us as mm-hmm. a community. And, you know, I remember doing the steps to mm-hmm. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Yes. And uh, that really, you know, influenced me. So to grow up and meet people like that and get to tell them how much they meant to you was quite an honor. Uh, But when they wanted to establish that personal relationship, it was a little scary too. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's about the the stories you're telling me or telling us just makes you think the importance of advocating for yourself right. and being persistent, whether it's the president and Brown or Aretha right. Franklin. It's like when you want something, when you want someone to show up, you have to engage. And sometimes you can't take a no. Right. And that feels like a, um, a underlining theme throughout the book of finding your voice, trusting yourself and being able to move forward with whatever decision you make. Right. And especially as a CEO, because you're always telling people no. Yeah. One time I went home when my daughter was younger and, you know, she asked me how my day was. And I said, well, it's kind of hard. All I did all day long was say no. No to budget requests, no to new programming, no to charitable contribution. I mean, it was just one of those days where I felt like, and I, you know, I was raised to be a good girl, (laughs) not to say no. Well, you always say you were the nice one. Right. So what does that mean as the nice one and being a CEO? Yeah, it was tough because when I was uh, appointed COO, I got all these flowers and, you know, people were like, oh, nice people never win and you're so nice. And I was like, well, is that a sign of weakness? Mm -hmm. You know, do I have to work on that? And I found that I did, Mm -hmm. especially when you're back to your point, when you're managing men. Yeah. And when I got the COO position, all the men in the room wanted my job. Oh, they were mad. They were mad. Mm -hmm. They were mad. And, you know, I I say it literally took me six years to get my own team together. Mm. Um, Because one of the first things Bob Johnson did, he kicked me out of the room, talked to the people who looked upset and told them, don't worry, she can't fire you. Wow. (laughs) It's really hard to manage people if they think you can't fire them. (laughs) So I imagine you had to fire some people. I had to fire some people, (laughs) some left willingly. And after six months, I had to go back and ask Bob. I said, please go in there and tell them I can fire them. (laughs) Because they're coming to meeting with sunglasses on. They're reading papers during my senior team meeting. I asked them to do something. I was trying to do the consensus building. You know, a lot of women are consensus builders. Let's talk about what's the best way. And then a decision Mm -hmm. is made. And then people go off and they're supposed to do the right thing and come back with what you ask them to do. Well, I had a team, mostly of men, who who didn't come back with anything. They didn't care. (laughs) They weren't invested in me. They weren't invested in the company. They were just biding time. Mm. Bob had hired all of them and their loyalty was to Bob. And he had to pull himself out of senior team meeting so I could run it. Mm -hmm. But with them thinking I couldn't fire them, it was it was a lost cause. Um, So, you know, eventually some of them left. Eventually, um, you know, some had to be terminated. And little by little, I got more women in the room. That's awesome. Right, because yeah. I felt like the testosterone <laughs> was, was taking over. And I didn't like going to my own 
senior team meetings. Yeah. I mean, that's where you're supposed to, you know, hand out the assignments, get excited about what the company is doing. And I didn't like it. And I figured the only way to, to even it out a little bit was to get more women yeah. in the room. And, uh, you know, over time, I hired people. They were more loyal to me and were invested in the company. Uh, but this constant celebrity thing was always <laughs> part of what I, part of my job. And it looks glamorous, but it was very hard. And you do a good point. job of sharing those, like, the behind the scene moments of being CEO and then having transitioned to the red carpet. Mm -hmm. um, and then knowing that people watching, the right. viewers, like I have so many fond member memories of watching BET, Team Summit, oh, um, yeah. you know, BET, After Dark, <laughs> you know, all, no, 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 okay. we're, all not, we're not talking about Uncut, are we? <laughs> I, I was a little bit older when, when it came Uncut, but oh, you know, okay. but I just like, there were so many things that really shaped my memories. I hear someone laugh at the audience, it's true, right. you know, but and then you have folks who come up to you, yeah. aren't you the BET lady, right. you know, yeah. like, and you're doing it for the culture and right. you have a, a chapter dedicated. Like, what does that mean when someone says, but comes up to you and says, thank you for doing it for the culture. Thank right. you for doing it for us, for black people. How yeah. does that feel to perceive that? That felt so great. It warmed my heart and it, it started happening more after I left. Mm -hmm. And people would recognize me on the streets of New York or, and especially young black men. Mm -hmm. And they would come up to me and say, Miss Lee, thank you for what you did for the culture. Mm -hmm. I was like, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And then I realized, you know, they were grateful to see black people on the air. Yeah. They were grateful that, you know, I kind of negotiated with the hip hop community. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't always happy about their music. We sent back videos. I mean, that was an ongoing mm -hmm. negotiation. We had a uh, standards and practices committee they would look at the videos. They would send them back if the women didn't have on enough clothes. Is that how we got to uncut? Is that oh. <laughs> so when I became CEO, CEO, first thing I did was cancel uncut. There you go. And I had never seen it. <laughs> uncut came on at three o'clock in the morning. I was never up that late. <laughs> and people were complaining about their kids watching Uncut. I'm like, well, what, why are they up? up at three? <laughs> 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 and then, um, I talk about the protesters I yeah. had outside my house for seven months. This minister uh, in Maryland decided he didn't like three videos. And so he called me and wanted to come meet with me. I said, sure. And so he said, you know, Miss Lee, I need you to take off three videos. And he named them. The only one I can remember is Little Wayne. It was uh, Duffel Bag. Yeah, Little yeah. Duffel Bag Boy, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. <laughs> <laughs> And so he said, research. these three videos refer to drug use. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how do you know? What are you, what are you talking about? Okay. And so he said, and, you know, we can't, uh, you know, you owe it to the community to take off anything that relates to drug use. And I said, well, do you remember Cloud Nine? Do you remember Strawberry Fields? Mm -hmm. You know, there's been a long... Um, What's Amy Winehouse song? I'm going back to rehab. Yeah. No, no, no. I yeah. mean, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of songs that refer to drug use, mm -hmm. and you know, my my response to him is, we can't go behind all these videos and try to figure out what they're talking about. That's mm -hmm. not what we do. But we do work with images. If they say something blatant, mm -hmm. you know, we we blocked out guns if they're, when the gangster rap was pop. You know, we just, in my mind, we did, did our best. Yeah. And we had a committee. We listened to our audience. And when they had a problem with a video, they bring it to me. I was the final decision maker. Mm -hmm. And I said to this minister, I said, well, if I let you take off three videos this month, You'll be back next month right. with three more videos. And then you're running BET, not me. Right. Right? You're right. That part. And I think another important distinction that, you know, between you two in that conversation was he didn't do that when Bob, Bob was, was right. in charge. Right. He, he, there were plenty of times, I'm sure, other videos that he could have protested uncut. or said, uncut. Right. <laughs> you know? And so again, your gender comes into play right. on when people feel they can trump you or, right. you know, negotiate, negotiate In, things. Yeah, intimidate you. Intimidate you, you, you know. And, and it was a safety issue for me. By this time, my son had gone to college. It was just, I was divorced. It was just me and my daughter at home. And he's busting down 200, 300 people to my house with, with, with signs that said, I'm, I'm not a hoe. I'm not a bitch. And... 
you know, who knew which one of those people would come back and be on hand? Yeah. And, you know, you feel like part of your privacy is that people don't know where you live. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, now 300 people know where I live. It's a wild thing. But it also brought a revelation of the title because, you know, one of you're like, all these people, they're protesting against who? Me. You? Right. But I am Deborah Lee. Right. Can you tell us about this title and how you landed on it? (laughs) Okay, that's a good question. But my first response was, why are they not protesting outside Ludacris's house? Or Nelly's house? Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, there's a whole list of people that make these music videos. Mm -hmm. And I guess because they lived in other cities, they didn't, you know, it's easier to come to my house. But I'm like, why are they holding me personally responsible Mm -hmm. for that? That's the first time I realized these were my decisions and I was going to get the praise or the blame. Yeah. So I might as well make the decisions myself. Yep. Because if they didn't like something, they were going to call Deborah Lee. Yeah. Why? I mean, you know, most people don't know who the head of NBC is or the head of, you know, (laughs) ABC or Bravo. Yeah. But they knew me and it was important to me that they knew me. And that's why I walked out on the, uh, BET Awards stage every year mm-hmm. to let them know a black woman was running the network. Yeah. And yeah, you can talk about yes. And that was especially important after Viacom acquired us. Because the mm-hmm. first pushback we got on Viacom acquiring us mm-hmm. was, oh, these white people are going to run BET. Mm-hmm. And we had a deal with Viacom that we would continue to make the uh, decisions, mm-hmm. especially the programming decisions. I mean, of course, we had to report to them on budget and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, they weren't, they didn't want to run BET. Mm-hmm. But whenever something bad happened, people were like, oh, that's some white people at Viacom. I was like, no, we're making it, I'm making a decision. Yeah. You know, so don't blame them. Right. Don't. So, I mean, I could tell you stories <laughs> um, about when people were fired and they blocked out the head of Viacom's phone and emails one day. <laughs> he had to move to another office to work. And he called me and said, who was to have a smiley and why did I fire him? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was the funniest thing I ever heard. And I had to explain to him who Javis Smiley was and explain to him that he did not fire him, that Bob Johnson fired him. <laughs> but anyway, that was a whole side thing. But um, it did make me have to work harder inside myself, you know, develop a brand for BET. What were the values of the company? What did I want it to stand for? We started having more competition. Mm-hmm. Uh, from, you know, Bravo had a black night, VH1 had Monday night, there was their black night, We TV had a black, you know, everyone had a black night. We were 24 hours every day, yes. but everyone else had a black night. Mm-hmm. And so they were testing the waters. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, the question would come up, well, what's the difference between you and TV1? You know, and I didn't have an answer for that. I mean, it used to be that black was our brand because yeah. we were the only one. And then when you have competition, black doesn't work anymore. Right. So we went into the, the conference room periodically for 18 months and came up with our brand that we wanted it to be. And it was to respect, reflect, and elevate our community. Mm. And if programming didn't do that, we shouldn't put it on the air. Mm. Because our, we knew our audience would watch that programming on other networks mm-hmm. and call it a guilty pleasure, yeah. whether it was Real Housewives of Atlanta or Flavor Flav or mm-hmm. whatever. They would say, oh, it's my guilty pleasure. I, that's what I do on Monday night. BUT put it out. I'd have protesters back yeah. outside my house mm-hmm. saying, why is Deborah Lee putting on this <laughs> <laughs> filthy reality show? I mean, so we we knew we had to um, be above the fray. I always said I didn't want it to be the black PBS, mm-hmm. but I wanted it to be authentic. Yeah. So, you know, on being Mary Jane, if her brother had a drug problem, you know, we wanted to help the brother out and show how you deal with it, but not pretend like no one black had a drug problem. Right. I mean, as part. And with scripted, you can you can um, mold the drama. Yeah. You know, on reality shows, you have to be outrageous mm-hmm. to get a laugh or to 
mm-hmm. create drama. You had to you had people cursing each other out and all of that. So back to the name. Yes, we have to put it, yes. <laughs> so I thought of a few names. First, I thought of "Aren't You the BET Lady," but I didn't want to. <laughs> I didn't want to perpetuate that one. Uh, then uh, what other one? I, I thought of a few, but this was my Twitter handle and my Instagram handle, mm-hmm. and you know I wanted it to be powerful because by the time I left BET you know, along the way, I started feeling powerful, Mm -hmm. you know, and someone told me once, you have the power, you got to use it. Yeah. And power was really nothing, not the thing I was seeking. Mm -hmm. But to run a network, you you have to exert the power Mm -hmm. to the people that work for you, to people you're doing deals with, and you can't let them walk over you or think you're too nice. Yeah. Or they can come and you know, by advertising on your network and you'll hand them your, your audience on a silver platter. You got to figure out what's in the best interest of the company. And if I wasn't making decisions based on that, mm-hmm. you know, Viacom should fire me. Yeah. Um, and I really found that out when I became CEO, because when you're a COO, no one asks you what your vision is. Mm-hmm. You know, you're carrying out the vision of whoever the CEO is. But yeah. when you become CEO, everyone starts saying, well, what's your vision? So I had to come up with a vision really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what is my vision? And, uh, you know, I decided that I wanted to provide the audience with high quality, authentic, scripted programming. Mm-hmm. That they were expecting that from us. They never understood why we were different from CBS, ABC, or NBC. Right. You know, when we put on what we call syndicated product, like the Parkers and Soul Food, I mean, I went down to Spelman and they beat up on me literally one time because I just bought this package of programming that included the Parkers, Soul Food, and uh, Girlfriends. Mm -hmm. And I had bought it, this may be something y'all, y'all don't care about. But in the industry, usually programming is on the networks. Then it goes to um, like Channel 20 or, you know, the lower tier networks for a few years. And it takes a long time for it to come to cable. Well, I bought this programming straight from the networks. And I thought I did this wonderful thing. Oh, I'm bringing this to BT before it goes anywhere else. And I went down to Spelman and the women said, why are you running those reruns on BET? I was like, that's what everybody does. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's what USA Network does. It's all reruns. And it's the number one network, number one cable network. Why are you all holding me to a difference? They're like, we don't want to see those shows. I'm like, what y'all watching? Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> they did really well in the ratings. Yeah. And uh, it was fresh program. But anyway, so you, you, we... You know, people are passionate about BET. Mm -hmm. They want to like it. They think it's part of them. They think any program they come up with should be on it. Yeah. You know, what do you you mean you turn down my program, right? (laughs) And, um, they, you know, so when we get it right, like with The Game or Being Mary Jane or New Edition Story or Mm -hmm. Black Girls Rock or BET Honors, they show up in huge numbers. Mm -hmm. We took over Girlfriend, uh, not Girlfriends, uh, The Game, Mm -hmm. after he had been off the air for two years. Mm -hmm. CW had it. They got about a million and a half viewers with each each show. Never promoted it, never did. They took it off the air. We had to convince CBS that we wanted it, we could do it at the same quality level. And um, (coughs) they didn't want to sell it to us, so the rights. So it took us two years to get it. The first night we put it on, after two years of it being off, it got 7.7 million. Wow. Wow. I mean, that just goes to show the power of us. Right. Of gathering together, watching together. like, And we want to do that. We want to like the programming. And... 7.7 7.7 million viewers for a sitcom premiere on cable mm-hmm. is still a record wow. for the game. Wow. It's still, no one else has, has beat us. Uh, Tyler Perry sent me um, flowers the next day. <laughs> and Jonathan Rogers, who was running TV One, called me. And, and they were also happy because we had proven the point that if you give our community quality programming, mm-hmm. they will show up. Yes. Yeah. And they will be happy and they will come back the next week. Mm-hmm. Now everybody knows that, which explains yeah. the, the uh, 
a higher amount of black programming on. They know the black community is very loyal audience. And if you give them what they want, they will show up. Well, I think that also makes the distinction what BET was doing under your tenure and continues to do is gather us, allows us to have collective community and be empowered. And as you said, respect, elevate, reflect, right, like right. all those things don't necessarily happen on an NBC or right. a Bravo. Like it's still a legacy institution. Right. And so I definitely want to speak to your um, your work and how you transitioned working with Bob Johnson, him being a pioneer in the industry and allowing you to have this space. Right. Well, what, there's so many great, um, I don't know if you were calling like his saying, but he was always like, it's simple oh, when right. it's not. Like some of the descriptions of the projects and things you were all doing, like, oh, that's a simple idea. Yeah, right. It feels like you adopted this idea of going beyond and thinking that nothing was impossible. Yeah. Was that his always his vision and his attitude? Yeah. And that was you had to um, you had to accomplish that to you know work for him. Mm -hmm. I remember he I had just come back from maternity leave with my first child, my son. And I don't know how many of you have come back from maternity leave, but usually when women come back from maternity, <laughs> they're kind of hiding because yeah. they haven't figured out the baby at home yet. And they have to come back saying they're a little sad that they left the baby, and yeah. <laughs> but they got to get back into the role of what they were doing. But they don't want to work too hard because they want to get back home to the baby. <laughs> so it's a really hard time. So I had just come back. I was trying to, you know, after three months of maternity leave, uh, and I had to write the maternity policy when I got pregnant because no other female executive had gone out on maternity leave. Um, so I'm coming back. And so the first um, senior team meeting, Bob said, oh, I have this idea. I want to start a magazine mm -hmm. for teenagers and I want it to be high quality and uplifting. And then he said, you know, who's interested in running? And a couple of guys raised their hand and he said, no, I don't want you to do it. No, no. And then someone finally said, Bob, who do you want to do it? And he said, Deborah. And I was like, oh <laughs> man, I'm still general counsel. I don't have time. I just built a studio. I don't have time to run a magazine. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I got the assignment of running a magazine. And um, he wanted it to come out much sooner than was logical, <laughs> you know? And so first I went and hired an editor and an art director and they started telling me this is not possible. We're not gonna get it out on his time frame. And I was like, you don't understand. When you work for Bob, you get it out on his. And so I went back to him, I said, Bob, they're saying they can't do it. He said, Deborah, it's simple. It's 60 pages with a staple in between. <laughs> <laughs> How long can that take? To produce, I was like, "Well, you gotta get that. You gotta write the articles. You gotta do the fashion." I mean, I was trying to explain to him. He's like, "No, no, no. It's just sixty pages with the state." He wanted y'all to go to Kinko's, right? <laughs> <laughs> but if we had come back with something that low quality, you know, he would have been totally beside himself. Mm -hmm. So that was a joke among the the executives there. Whenever he wanted something done, he would say, "It's simple." Mm -hmm. You know, don't talk to me about how hard it is. I'm gonna um, using that. You know, <laughs> at that time, this was, you know, still while I was general counsel, you know, his motto, where ours was um, respect, reflect, and elevate, his motto was have fun and make money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was in the early days of BET. So we were all working hard. You know, mm -hmm. we're trying to build this business. We went public, uh, and, as you said, as the first black company on New York Stock. You know, it was all so exciting. Mm -hmm. So we were working hard anyway. I mean, I worked much harder at BET than I did at the law firm. Mm -hmm. And it was because I loved it. And it what was, was exciting. What was it like being on the stock? Like, can you just extract oh, that man. day? Like how it felt to be... Like, yeah, it was it was amazing. Uh, one, I was still general counsel, so I had to do all the legal work mm -hmm. leading up to it, which meant I was working around the clock at the printer, living on M and M's because that's all they <laughs> that's all they gave you late at night with our outside counsel. And so I write in the book about the day I took the documents down to the SEC to file. Mm -hmm. That was an amazing day. Mm -hmm. uh, one, because I found a couple of typos on the way. So I'm sitting in the back of the car <laughs> and, and Bob said to me, Deborah, I want this file by Wednesday. No reason in the world. He was just tired of the process and he's like, 
Wednesday. And I said, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, no, I get it. It's simple, <laughs> right? Aren't you finished? You've been working on this for months. And so that day I said, I know I got to get down there by 530 and I'm in the back of a limo and I'm just, I don't know why I'm reading it, but I found a couple of typos. I'm correcting. I said, he said, Wednesday, we could wait till Thursday. It's not going to make a difference. I can get the typos printed up, but you know, that wasn't acceptable. So when I walked into SEC, all black people, behind the counter Mm -hmm. and they saw me come in and then when I told them I was from BET they were just over the moon they had never seen a black company come into the SEC and they were high-fiving each other so that was amazing and then the day we first started trading uh we went up to New York, the whole senior team. Again, we were on the floor and the black people were like, oh my God, where do these black people come from? <laughs> <laughs> They're in suits. They must be in when they realized it was BET. They were high-fiving us. I got a really nice call from a guy named uh, Harold Dooley. I hope I don't get his name wrong. He had a seat. He was the only black person that had a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. Wow. And he called me like two weeks before we went public. And he said, I hear you all are going public. I would be so honored Mm. if I could just stand with you on the floor of the Stock Exchange. And I went and asked Bob, was it all right? And he said, of course. And so he came and stood with us. And, you know, he said, I've never seen a black company go public. Wow. Wow. And so our offering price, I still have all these numbers in my head. Our off- offering price was $17. Mm-hmm. And this was after a long road show and talking to investors. And um, that day, it went up to $28, $29. You hear that? That's incredible. That's incredible. Yes, we can clap for that. That's so incredible. And, you know, all of a sudden we were an American success story. Yeah. It's like, this is America. Now, if you told me I worked at a corporation mm-hmm. and would be taking a company public when I was in law school, I would have said, no, <laughs> I will never sell out like that. <laughs> I'm more militant than that. I don't want to have anything to do with corporate America. But I found this little black company, and by the time we went, it was very meaningful, and uh, it was the right thing to do. That's and um, so anyway, we were a su- success story. Uh, Bob made lots of money. <laughs> he had fun. He had got some money. He got some <laughs> money. The executives didn't have any stock. Mm. So we didn't make any money Aww. until it was so until we got stock later on. Anyway, that's a whole long story. But uh, you, you uh, gotta read the you gotta read the book to get to that part. Well, but uh, it it was so much fun. We went out for lunch afterwards and celebrated. I mean, it was a really high point in my career. I used to say when people say, you know, what's the high point of your career? I was like, well, being on New Stock Exchange, it doesn't get better than that. But then when I um, uh, when the game got 7.7 million, I was like, thank God, I got yes. something else to say. And then uh, I'm trying to think of other things. It was always, it was such a team effort. Mm-hmm. And, and so it felt like winning the Super Bowl. Yeah. You know, when we had a program, and like I said, you get the ratings the next day. So, you know, you know, when BT Awards came on, we you could tell after Twitter came out, if you were top 10 trending topics, mm-hmm. you were in good shape to be the number one show. Yeah. And we'd get 10 million viewers. So there are so many many um so many high points uh being mary jane was a high point i love that show. yeah that was the first show i created. yeah i love being mary jane that was the first show i greenlit in the room well thank you yeah Good. i, I love so much and i related to it you know yeah. successful one in the family not mary she had relationships she had issues at work mm-hmm. um you know she had issues at home she had um, all her sticky notes on the mirror right. i still do that oh, do you? <laughs> That's yes, so I do. Great. and uh it was a current time movie you know shows it wasn't you know 200 years ago <laughs> was, i mean it was just so much to relate to yeah. and the thing i liked about it most is men liked it too yeah a lot of men watched uh being mary jane yeah. And would call me and say, were you looking in my window? Like, you know, how, <laughs> how did you know about that? And then when the new edition story came out and that was a yeah, huge so success. Good. So, you know, it was it was a lot of fun. But going going public was amazing. Then we went private, yep. which was a whole nother story because that took us 10 months. Mm-hmm. And then everybody was like, well, I don't want to give my stock back. 
It yeah. was like, well, we're going private. You got to give it back. And then we were acquired by uh, Viacom. Viacom. So yeah. there were all these corporate moves that were going on on top of our regular day-to-day -day work, yeah. putting programming on the air. It's just so extraordinary and refreshing to read your story because you get this riveting memoir. You get like beautiful uh, pieces of you as a young girl, you as a CEO in council with your family. Um, and there's so many personal moments. And I know this is probably as you've been going on the tour, you've gotten this question. But why was it important for you to share your personal relationship with Bob Johnson, the book as well? And what would you say to critics? Like, there's so, again, there's so much in this book. And if people singled out that moment, yeah. Like, what do you think? Well, I, I knew that was going to happen. Yeah. Uh, I had to write about it. And uh, we had worked together a long time before we started having a personal relationship. And we were both married at the time. And then we both got divorced. And then we sort of, you know, started dating out publicly. Uh, but it was an important part of my story. Yeah. And, you know, if I hadn't told it, I probably would have got more critics because mm -hmm. most most people knew we were dating. Yeah. Um, but it was, you know, and it was hard um, uh, near the end of the relationship when he was about to leave the company and I was trying to hang on so I could be CEO and the relationship wasn't working anymore. And, um, um, you know, then I was told if I broke up with him, I would lose my job, mm -hmm. and I would never be CEO, and I had to leave tomorrow. Um, so that was that was hard to deal with. Yeah. And um, uh, again, back to the fact that I didn't have very many female um, mentors. You know, I didn't have a lot of people to talk to about it. Yeah. And um, so anyway, I hung on, and I yeah. finally made it to be CEO, and I was CEO for 13 years mm -hmm. after he left. Um, but it, it's just, you know, again, I wanted to give young girls advice mm -hmm. and I guess my advice would be think, think hard before you get involved in the office romance, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it just, you know, hardly ever works out, yeah. <laughs> you know, even if you think it's working out yeah. and after the Me Too and Time's Up uh, movement came out, you know, I realized that my story was close to that, you know, it wasn't as horrific as some of those were, uh, but I still felt like I was um, being manipulated by a person in a relationship who had more power than I did. Yeah, and I think that's the, the part that I took away is just like power dynamics. Right. When you're in a corporate setting, when you're um, ambitious and thriving and looking for different support systems right. where, you know, where you can find yourself in a situation that you didn't expect. Right. You know? And in the media business, and it was loud and clear from me too, you know, so much of the business takes place over dinner, mm -hmm. at events, you travel together. You know, we used to have meetings in Bob's hotel room. You know, sometimes it'd be three or four executives, sometimes it'd just be me. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was, it's just a, a, a situation uh, that's wrought with you know, potential risk. Mm -hmm. And as a woman, you have to say, okay, where am I going to draw the line? Yeah. Am I going to say, no, I'm not coming to your hotel room to talk about this issue because I'm a woman and that's risky? You know, does that put your job at risk? Yeah. You know, do you say, no, I don't, you know, want to go out to dinner with you alone? You know, we got to have other people there. It's just, you know, it's still a hard line, even though we know it's an issue and we know it's something that women deal with every day. Mm -hmm. Um, it's 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 hard to figure out how and when yeah. you address it. Well, it goes back to the beginning of this conversation. It's like, why did you decide to yeah. tell this story? I was I felt it. I just really really admire you for just regardless of something is taboo or feels like um, controversial, the fact that you are owning all of your story, right. the good, the challenging, the bad, like you really put it all out here in the book and it just feels so honest and transparent and it feels like you were very intentional yeah. and I, I just want to thank you for just allowing us to experience that with you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And you know I don't I don't want to spoil things in the book but I also talk about the fact that right before I went to law school I had an abortion. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know I yeah. you know had a one night thing with the guy got pregnant and I'm on my way to Harvard Law School. Yeah. And Roe v. Wade was decided three years before that summer. 
And I was able to make the decision I wanted to make wow. with my body. Yeah. And now, yeah. and now I see those rights taken away from women and I worry about it. Yeah. And I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have the ability to make that decision. Yeah. I probably wouldn't have gone to Harvard, at least not that year, would I've gone another year. Yeah. And, you know, I wanted to go to Harvard. I want to be, well, I didn't really want to be a lawyer. My dad wanted me to be a lawyer, <laughs> but I had agreed to that. But, um, um, but I didn't even have time to think about grieving or, you know, how I, I just like, got to go. Yeah. You know, I start next week. And uh, I'm like, how many other women deal with that? Yeah. You know, yeah. and how many other women feel um, ashamed or guilty? I mean, I've never talked out loud about this. I've thought about it as different issues have come up uh, and, you know, Planned Parenthood and um, or dealing with these issues, but I just have never talked about it out loud. And like I said, I wanted young people to know we all have challenges. Yes, yes. Thank it's not you. ever as easy as it looks. Yeah, and, and you make it look good. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I do have I'm one last question, but I know folks in the audience have questions too. So if you have your question, get prepared to come to the mic. Questions, polite, brief comments, you know. So this is my, um, my last question. Clearly, you are a pioneer in this revolution of black media. We know that, we acknowledge that, we are thankful for it. So looking from where you started, right in the beginning to now, 2023, what is your like hope for the future of Black media? Wow. Um, I hope it remains as popular as it is now. We are having a golden moment in terms of Black programming on the streaming services, on TV, uh, and on films. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, they finally realized that our audience will show up. Yeah. Uh, now Asians are demanding the same respect, Latinos, mm -hmm. and we all know that sometimes the doors open and a few years later it's the shut. doors are shut. Yep. And you see Oscars so white or you see shows being canceled and not knowing why. So I hope it just remains a priority and our young people have opportunities. My daughter writes for Abbott Elementary. Yeah. And <laughs> And she's so talented and having so much fun. Of course, it's one of the most popular shows mm -hmm. on TV right now. Um, and I'm so happy for her. Mm -hmm. She's getting ready. She's getting, she's well able to follow her dream. Mm -hmm. And I just want that to continue, that yeah. we have opportunity. So I think we've come uh, a good distance, but not far enough. Um, you know, I wish we had the ability to own our own networks again yeah. or you know um, um, you know have control of the green light decisions mm -hmm. but in lieu of that if someone asks me how can I get into you know the media business and, okay. and programming I would say start a production company right now yeah because you can yeah. own it and you can sell that uh, programming to all kinds of people, yeah. digital, cable, satellite, you know, streaming. Mm -hmm. um, so it really is, um, you know, as someone said to me, if you're a black actor or a black director and you can't get work right now, you know, <laughs> right. Some, something's wrong because <laughs> there are a lot of opportunities right now. So I hope that that stays open and um, we need to tell our stories and yeah. all kinds of stories, not just slavery stories, not just, you know, Westerns, but you know, what's going on now. Yeah. And, you know, a movie like Crazy Rich Asians comes out mm -hmm. and Hollywood surprised. How can you still be surprised? Right, right. You know, there hasn't been a movie focused on Asians, you know, since Joy Luck Club or something. <laughs> and uh, the guy who greenlit it at uh, Warner Brothers, uh, 
was Asian. Mm -hmm. And he was scared to green light it because he thought they would say he just did it because he was Asian, which is like, why? Yeah. Why is that a problem? And he had to get the, re I heard him speak at a Black filmmaker summit. He had to get the research and the evidence yeah. and wow. prove to his bosses that it was the right thing to do. And this year, it looks like a big year for Asians with everywhere, everything, mm -hmm. and a lot of other things. Um, going on, but you know, it's just amazing to me that we still have these issues. We still have to prove ourselves. Yeah. Even if you have something like Wakanda forever, and right. it does better than any other Disney movie I ever. Know, it's so good. Then the next day they make the little mermaid black and everybody's up in arms. It's like, <laughs> oh, it's like what is going on? Right. So I, I do have, since you mentioned your daughter on Abbott oh. Elementary, we love that show. We all love right. that show. Um, but if if she wants to, you know, write you in for a career day, I would love for you to be on Abbott as like a like a guest. Oh, that's a good idea. You should idea. do tell her to do a career day. You come in and you talk about something. I, I'm gonna pitch that. Yes, to her. there you go. <laughs> Yeah. She won't do it though. <laughs> and then Quincy would be like, "Are you the BET lady?" <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, my daughter's my daughter's name is Ava Coleman, so she doesn't have the last name. She never tells anyone I'm her mother. I mean, you know, she that, just, that sounds like a daughter, though. Yeah. I feel like I think most people would be like, "No, nah, when, when I sh <laughs> when I showed up for Parents' Day when she went to USC. People were like, Deborah Lee's your mother. <laughs> she's like, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. She's yeah, vetting people. Yeah, she's yeah, smart. Yeah, she yeah, letting people, she you know. She wants to do it on her own. And yeah. I, I uh, admire her for that. That's awesome. So, thank you. So we do have our questions. We'll start on this side. Hi, Ms. Deborah. Hi. <laughs> so you mentioned about mentors, because yes. I had three mentors and they meant. Yeah. I never came across a female that um that was close to me that I can call a mentor mm -hmm. it was always a male why mm -hmm. do you think that is well uh do you know any women that you admire and would like yeah, to be your but they not like I admire you so oh not, like, 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 she might be a little so busy I, <laughs> Okay, that, I was, that was a loaded question. Yeah, so I brought Nicole Hannah Jones to Baltimore. Oh, yeah. I um, love her. For a book signing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the owner of Urban Reed Bookstore. Yeah. <laughs> and provided all the books for tonight. Thank you yes. very much. And I told her, I said, I'm going to make you my mentor. She said, No, I'm going to make you my mentor. Uh, so it's like, it's extinct with, when it comes to women. It stinks. It's it's like it stinks, yeah. So it's not a, it's not okay. happening. Oh, right. a it's lot. Like it's not extinct. Like yeah. It's not oh, okay. So, so why is that? The fastest way not to get a mentor is to ask someone to be your mentor. Mm -hmm. You know, when you ask a busy person to be your mentor, flashing lights go on in their head. It's true mm -hmm. because it means they got to dedicate dedicate time to you. That's their first thought, whether it's once a quarter, once a year. So their first reaction, and I don't know if it's women react this way differently than men, but my first reaction if somebody asked me to be their mentor is, you know, I can't do that. You know, I have 500 people at my company. I'm their mentor. <laughs> my, I have an open door policy and I just can't do it. The best way to get a mentor is to invite someone you admire out to coffee. And if that goes well, four months later, ask them out to lunch. Mm -hmm. And if you hit it off, then the mentorship will come naturally. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. I deal with this all the time. People yeah. want me to be their mentor. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. I mean, every time I go, I like, every time I go out and give a speech, five women come up to me after the speech and say, will you be my mentor? I know. I was like, about to ask her after this. <laughs> <laughs> And you know you could you could dedicate your whole career to being a mentor. 
into it. Yes. And mm -hmm. then if you're trying to run a company, you're not going to be successful. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's just, you just have to follow it. Um, there's a, a young attorney, he's not as young anymore, that used to work for me at BET. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we would go out for lunch or dinner or coffee, and then we just kept up with each other after he uh, left BET and went to several other media companies. And so I've never called him my mentee, but I would think, you know, we that's the kind of relationship we have. Mm -hmm. And you just have to make it work naturally, yeah. you know, and yeah, yeah. oh, there he is. <laughs> hey, Fabian, uh, he even came tonight. And uh, whether he lives, oh. I think first that day, but to your point, it's it happens naturally organically because number one, he's good at what he does, and I always admire her. Mm -hmm. And we always kept in touch, and I always followed her. So it became not only a friendship, but I always looked at what she did. And it's also modeling. It's yeah. following that person's career and really staying in touch with what they're doing, and it will naturally. So I just want to say thank you. No, oh, thank you. Thank you. And, and he's my mentor also. I always ask him to put advice, but he's got, had jobs in uh, L.A. and New York. And, you know, we just always stayed in touch. So it developed naturally. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We have one more question. Yes. Yeah. Hi, hi, I'm Lori. I'm Lori Hall McKissick now. <laughs> just got what? married. Lori Hall McKissick. Oh, okay. um, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. I was trying to frame up my question in my head because um, you talked about so many things that were so relatable. My mother-in-law brought me, I'm trying not to cry. Mother-in-law mm. brought me to my, I'm a new mother. Mm, your new mother, yeah. I don't, I don't okay. cry easily, sorry. Yeah. Catching me off guard a little bit. She brought me tonight an hour and a half away from DC because she knew I was a fan. And your career kind of, um, my career is mimic yours. Oh. I launched all of Tyler Perry shows back oh. at TBS oh, from the course. first to the last. Yes, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I was the head of marketing for TV One for six years. Wow. And then I started my own agency, Multicultural Marketing, two yeah. years ago. That's mm -hmm. great. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Some of the things that you talked about spoke to me, and I wanted to ask you, if I may, two questions. I don't see anybody else here yet. Uh, the first one is, how did you handle the identity crisis of motherhood mm. once you had your first child and had to be back at work? And for me, just to give you a little context, it's a little different because I've been in my own agency for a couple of years now. Literally launched February 2020, the pandemic hit March 2020. Mm -hmm. But thank you, Jesus, that Black people had our renaissance and this racial reckoning that made my agency so vital. Oh, and good. so we not only survive, we thrive. But when I had my child uh, 11 months ago, um, there's like an identity crisis. You're this big boss, you're running things, you're doing things, then you have the baby, and mm -hmm. then maternity leave is over, and they're like, go. Mm -hmm. How did you handle that transition back, and what advice would you give a new mom to try to navigate being a company owner, business mm -hmm. owner, and motherhood? Well, I think the first thing to realize is there's no balance. You're not, right. gonna, you're not gonna find life work balance, it doesn't exist. Uh, you're gonna do what you have to do at home, when you have to do it, you're gonna do what you have to do at work. And sometimes it's like a, a what are those, the seesaw? Yeah, it's up here, it's up here. And I used to do uh, incredible things like take red eyes or when I had the company plane, I had, I had nice resources. So I had people that worked for me at home. I had uh, a company plane a lot of time. I could set my own schedule. Mm -hmm. So I made sure I was there for the basketball game or the recorder concert. I missed one recorder concert. My daughter still reminds me to this day. Like, you know, it'll be an Abbott Elementary. Right. <laughs> right. Remember that recorder concert you missed? Oh, wow. But you really do, you have to try your best to be there, whether you're driving across town for the Halloween parade that lasts 15 minutes in the middle of the day, whether you're going to three o'clock soccer games, you know, you want to be there for your children. And I wanted to be there and I, I could. Uh, and then there are times, you know, like when, well, we went, no, we, I went, we went public after my son Quinn was born. Um, when, you know, I, I can't go home at night for a long time or I'm traveling. Uh, I tried not to be away from home more than uh, 
three or four uh, days at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, it was also in my custody agreement. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so it made me stick to it. Um, but you just have to find, you find a way to do it. I tell the story about how I had a cesarean with my son, and I know that's going to make some of the men squirm, and, and maybe some of the women squirm too. But I had a cesarean. I was still on maternity leave. I had three months of maternity leave, and eight weeks into it, a client, uh, we were negotiating negotiating with BMI, the music licensing company, and they insisted I come to New York for a meeting. And my outside counsel, who was in New York, said, she just had a baby, she, you know, she had a cesarean, she can't, it, they just insisted. They didn't so, want to Zoom? Huh? They didn't want to Zoom? They didn't have Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. But I could have been on the phone, I don't, they wouldn't agree to that. So I get on a plane, first time away from my son, and I didn't know when you're away from your baby, if you don't breastfeed, Oh, your Lord. breasts get hard. Yes, yes, yes. Right? Your breasts get hard as rocks. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that. But luckily, I had a pump with me. Mm -hmm. So I get to New York. I go into this fancy law firm. I see all the guys. There are 10 guys. I'm the only woman. 10 guys sitting in the conference room. I head straight to the bathroom to pump my breast because I couldn't have made it through the meeting otherwise. And I'm standing in the bathroom, you know, throwing <laughs> like breast milk milk. down the toilet. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, there's got to be a better way to do this. And again, women don't talk about that. Yeah. They don't talk about how hard it is to breastfeed once you go back to yeah, work. Right. A lot of women stop mm -hmm. at the three month mark. Um, and um, it, it just sticks with me to this day. And when I used to go out doing a lot of speaking, I still do a lot of speaking, I would talk about it. And I'd get notes from women saying, oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Because, yeah. you know, the men just don't understand. And I came back home. I was in the same building. I talk about this in the book with Toys R Us. I built, bought my son the biggest Raggedy Ann doll. It was this big, and took it home and tried to make up to him for <laughs> for leaving him after eight weeks. But sometimes you just, you know, you have to do it. You have to jump through hoops. And th let me tell you another thing. At 18, they leave you. <laughs> after all this you know devotion to your children making sure when my son went away to uh college i was like what did i used to do on saturdays before you know no more football games no more soccer games and then he didn't call i'm like he didn't even call me and so that was a hard transition but again like i said at the beginning i knew i wanted children and i just had to make it work and uh, I tell women all the time, I had three or four people working at my house in the height of my career. Mm -hmm. I had a house manager, I had a chef, I had a, yep. a babysitter, yep. and I had a housekeeper. Yep. And I needed every one of them, yep. right? Yep. And luckily, I had enough resources to pay for them. Mm -hmm. And, right. yep. you know, women, we want to do it. The first, uh, with my first child, I didn't have a night nurse. Now that's pot. Post, uh, popular. I didn't have a day nurse. The three months I was at home, I took care of my child all by myself. And if I was able to get a shower, it yep. was a good day. That's real. That's real. <laughs> yeah. My husband would come home from work like, where's that great meal you cook? And I, I didn't have time for that. I was taking care of a baby. So, you know, you just have to find wh what you can do, what you can't do, and ask for help. Yeah. And, and please, self-care. Mm -hmm. It's so important. Yeah. It's so important because that's the thing we leave, especially as, yeah. especially as black women. Mm -hmm. That's the thing we leave to. I mean, if you could see my nails right now, I, I'm embarrassed because that's the last thing I think about, or I haven't had a massage in four months. Um, but please work the self care because it's so important for mental health and for your physical health. So yeah, it can be yeah. done. <laughs> Thank you. She <laughs> talks all about it in chapter six, balance. <laughs> You'll enjoy. We didn't get to that, but I did oh, mark yeah. it. <laughs> this will be our last question. Hi, Deborah. I'm Walt Pearson. I work with Brown Capital Management, so I have a more financial type question. I'm curious. Um, we say our number one asset at Brown Capital Management are our people. So I was a little surprised when you said, <clears throat> Initially, no one had stock other than Bob Johnson. Mm -hmm. You guys went public. Did he realize that his number one asset 
for his people. Mm. So that you guys push him, take us through that for stock, worst case scenario, phantom stock, if not outright equity, mm -hmm. and then take us through going private and then going public. I actually saw your company mm -hmm. many years ago at a conference where I was a portfolio manager at Alliance Capital. The stock was well below 28 when I saw you guys. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I, yeah. I got a story so I, for I, I that. I don't know if you went through the pressures of being a public company and just became too much where you said, let's go private and then you did the Viacom deal to make a lot of folks rich. I saw Bob Johnson on TV the other day talking about he's made more black millionaires than anybody, which I think is debatable. <laughs> Brown Capital, we've done very well too. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. But uh, I'm just curious, take us through. Well, you know, that's a really good question. And I don't know why Bob made that decision. Uh, I think at the time, he really didn't know what to do. And it's not like he didn't want to motivate us, but I think he thought it, it, it wasn't the right thing to do to give the uh, senior management team stock when you're first going public. And I guess that's because he didn't know a lot about going public. And he had John Malone as a backer and other people as backers. And I don't know if they advised him about that or what, but you're right. I mean, as a management team, we were demotivated. You know, we were, you know, we were, we were upset about that. And, um, you know, we did a lot of talking among ourselves, but we didn't really go back to Bob and push him. We didn't think we had the uh, ability to do that. Um, and so it wasn't until, you know, maybe a year later that we got some phantom stock, uh, and we started getting stock that really wasn't worth anything because what happened is we, we had a CFO, I talk about this in the, in the book that wasn't really competent and she couldn't explain something on an analyst call and our stock went into a free fall and we, Bob had to call the New York Stock Exchange and ask them to stop trading in our stock. And we had to have another analyst call the next day to try to explain what, and it was an issue about our um, subscriber count. Nielsen had a different count than we did. And it was because, um, you know, there was an explanation. Uh, and so there was always a discrepancy, but our CFO couldn't explain it. And it was terrible. We were in the office to midnight that night trying to figure out what to do. And um, so it slowly came back, but we had a really rough time uh, building the stock back up. And so whatever stock we had wasn't worth anything. Uh, but we kept working. And then um, when we went private, um, several of the executives sold whatever they had because they didn't trust that Bob would take care of them. Mm. And they stayed at the company, but then they sold all their stock. Mm. And then he was upset about that. He's like, well, you all aren't invested in company. And they're like, well, you know, we got burned once. Mm. Um, and then we went, pri I mean, uh, we sold to Viacom uh, because they asked, they wanted to acquire us. And um, we didn't, Bob didn't want to sell the whole company. So he said, why don't you take a, a small uh, equity position, small position, and they didn't want to do that. And mm -hmm. so then we went around and talked to other companies and no one at that time was interested. So we went back to uh, Viacom and they bought the company at $240 a share. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everyone made a lot of money then. And, um, and, and, you know, we got the social, we called them social issue promises from them that we could still run the company and, and they wouldn't buy it and turn it into the real estate channel or something like that. Um, and so they were committed to BET. So it seemed like the right thing to do at the time. And then you probably know some other black media companies sold half 50%, I think Essence sold 50%, and it became a popular thing to do. And I guess the issue was, you know, do, do you have to have black ownership to serve the, the black uh, marketplace and audience? You know, can you get the kind of um, um, authority that you want? Uh, and I know Essence went through that same thing. Um, so anyway, you may have heard uh, BT's up for sale. I was very. Mm -hmm. 
Byron Allen. That's mm -hmm. yeah. So right, let's not... do a boat. Hands up for Tyler. Hands up for oh. Byron. <laughs> <laughs> what do y'all think? So I'm not involved in it. I don't know what's going on. People keep asking me. Um, but they're saying that one of the issues is that Viacom wants it to have, or Paramount wants it to have black ownership again. Mm, that's so interesting. Know. It'll be interesting. But I have, it, it's, I have it's, another idea for your daughter. We got, does anyone watch Succession? We should do like a, a show <laughs> about BET with a like succession type <laughs> format. You know, you know I'm available a, for development. There's a new book out about Paramount. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't read it yet. But Succession is supposed to be based on the Murdoch thing. Yeah, we have to do a, yeah. a Succession on, on BET. Uh, Who, who's going to play you, play you Beverly? Who, we got to find an actress. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been but that was a very good question. That was Thank a great question. This has been so extraordinary. Thank you so much. Let's Thank give you. a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So do you all do you all know about Well Read Black Girl? Oh, that's me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. So thank you for your support. Oh, I mean so much. But I'm they, honored. you know tell you where the books are coming from, who they yes. are. And Please follow us on Instagram. Please support. We're a nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. We do work nationwide. We're just honored to support your work. Yeah, and our book you. for this for March is Deborah's book. So we're going to be reading it together <laughs> virtually. So yes, wellreadblackgirl.org. On behalf of the Pratt, I want to thank Gloria and I want to thank Deborah again. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to thank the Browns for providing all, all of the books. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I usually say at this point, please go outside and support our, one of our local indies, but you don't have to tonight because you <laughs> all have a copy. So thank you. I'm going to ask you, yes, I'm going to ask you all to, uh, when you exit, if you'd like to have your book signed, there's a line that'll be forming against the wall. Pratt staff will be out there to help you. We'll be out there in a couple of minutes to get your book signed. Perfect. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Can we take a picture? Sure. And so